the responses to Francis's statement that traditional Catholics who do not accept the errors of Vatican II are not in the Church have come in hot and fast. Now, I'll be going over the sort of gamut of them today, to be clear. This cannot possibly be comprehensive since there are more and more responses coming in. I fully expect Pastor Jimmy Martin of the Jesuit Church to chime in sooner or later. But the responses can be boiled down to two main camps. The hierarchy's response coming in the form of, of Francis outlets demanding submission and surrender of the traditionalist movement. And then the Vigano response, which will include at least one well-known traditionalist commentator that I'm certain most of you are subscribed to, who pointed out something that everyone here is missing. But let's frame this with the words of Pope Francis on the new secular feast day of human fraternity, when he said, Either we are brothers or we destroy each other. There is no time for indifference now. And the challenge of our times is that we are brothers or we are enemies. Ah, the irony. Well, let's not waste any more time. Let's just get right into this. Let's begin with the response from the hierarchy, which is best encapsulated in the article from LaCroix magazine, which took time off from sipping their flavored sparkling water drinks to publish the following article. Get ready for this headline. Traditionalists, it's time to choose. Pope Francis offers his clearest interpretation yet of the Second Vatican Council. This article is penned by one of the more famous Catholics who has gained notoriety for his dislike of all things traditional, Mr. Massimo himself, who has earned the nickname Max Beans. According to Mr. Bean, quote, Pope Francis recently took his diocese's home country's bishops to task for ignoring his call five years ago for a national synod, and in doing so, he offered the church throughout the world the closest thing we've seen of what might be called his interpretation of the Second Vatican Council. In an address to the National Catechetical Office of the Italian Bishops Conference on January 30th, the Pope urged them, as he did during a major church gathering in Florence in 2015, to begin a process for a national synod. Up till now, the Bishops Conference has basically ignored the Pope's directive, but other important elements of the church in that country have not. Several Catholic magazines, including the Jesuit journal La Civilta Cattolica, and a number of theologians have kept the idea of a synod alive. It will be interesting to see if, even after Francis's intervention on January 30th, the Italian bishops will still ignore the Pope's request to plan a national synod. The address was not just for the Italians. It's also a signal sent to those churches that have already initiated a national synodal process, such as Germany and Australia, and others that are contemplating one. We no longer live in a church where the National Episcopal Conferences do almost automatically what the Pope asks or encourages them to do, and that's not unique to the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops and its attitude towards Francis, end quote. Okay, just one second here. Max here has a history of suggesting that the USCCB does not fall in line with Francis at every turn, that the USCCB is some sort of hotbed of traditionalism and objection to Francis. Now, let's go back through the wormhole into the alternate dimension where that Max lives in to continue with this. He goes on to repeat what Francis said, that Vatican II is a magisterium of the Church, and that anyone who rejects it doesn't stand with the Church. Then the article says this, quote, Vatican II was the fruit of a theological cultural order that is now in ruins, and that is why the Church needs a new commentary of the Council. But Francis's pontificate represents a time to choose. Much more tradi for traditionalists, than for the innovators. The two groups' criticisms of Vatican II are clearly not the same or equivalent. One way to understand Francis's uh, selection and pontificate is as a response to the neo-traditionalist surge that was emboldened by Benedict's time as Bishop of Rome. What Francis says and what he represents on the interpretation of Vatican II is more a correction than a completion of Benedict XVI's course. That last pontificate did nothing to moderate the radical rejection of Vatican II by the schismatic traditionalists in actuality gave legitimacy to the anti-Vatican II Catholic traditionalists in communion with Rome. The problem is the split around interpretations of the Council is much more serious today than it was during the pontificates of John Paul II and Benedict XVI. There has been a hardening of positions, especially on the, on, on the traditional side. Francis's disavowal of the blessings given to the traditionalist agenda up until 2013 make him look more theologically innovative than he actually is. As for what concerns the magisterial interpretation of Vatican II, this pontificate is actually more about undoing rather than doing, and that by itself is no small feat, end quote. And that is a staggering bit of admission from him because he's not incorrect, and I'll tell you why at the end. But did you catch that? 
not only was, must we submit to a council that, that is represented by Max's own admission there, a failed set of ideas and time periods, traditionalists, meaning Catholics who understand the faith, need to submit essentially to a Vatican III. Boy, do the hits keep coming. Massimo is one of those figures that if you spend any time on Catholic Twitter, you get to know his hot takes, which are always fawning of Francis. And this is no different. Francis is the real traditionalist, a moderate, according to this view. Think about that opinion while we move on. That article, like the rest, are all my sources of my sources are linked at returntotradition.org in today's show notes, so you can read them for yourself. It's the name of this of this channel, the .org at the end. It'll take you there. There's no paywall. Ignore the Patreon pop up if you don't want to become a patron. I didn't read anywhere, by the way, near that whole article for you, so we can just move on. It's clear that the hierarchy and their allies are wasting no time in demanding obedience to modernism. All over social media, you'll see the champions of Vatican II repeating the refrain that trads must choose either the church or schism, though I think they're right in a way, just not in the way that they mean. Vatican II was, by the admission of some of the innovators and radical leaders, an attempt from within the church to do what Luther and Calvin did outside the church, which almost by definition makes it not Catholic. Something to remember about Francis's statements here are that these were off-the-cuff statements that have no magisterial weight themselves. But it is clear that Francis and the modernists are emboldened. And in a twist of irony, Francis told opinion makers from American Catholic outlets that they need to foster togetherness in the church and in the broader society. Again, the irony, given his statements. He also praised in work, the work of the church in America in its working with Caesar because it fits his vision of the mission of the church. These statements were all made in the same day or right about that as the statements demanding submission. Ponder that one. The responses from the other side were telling. Friday, I presented Archbishop Vigano's response, if you, which if you haven't heard it yet, I recommend that you do. It's a scathing response. In it, Vigano points out the utter hypocrisy of all this, where the authentic magisterium of the church is often challenged and rejected by the innovators, without sanction, by the way, but anyone who points out the errors of Vatican II, which include formal statements embracing errors that had been outlined in the syllabus of errors, which was a real magisterial document, that person or group is rejected by what Vigano calls the Bergolian Church. Quoting Vigano, in the merciful Bergolian Church, the heirs of the post-conciliar church, which are both variants of a spirit that no longer has anything Catholic about it, it is illicit to discuss, contest, and reject any dogma, any truth of the faith, any magisterial document, and any papal pronunciation prior to 1958. Since, according to the words of Francis, one can be brothers and sisters of everyone, any believer can clearly understand the very grave implications of the present pseudo-magisterium, which brazenly contradicts the constant teaching of sacred scripture, the divine tradition, and the apostolic magisterium. However, the naive victim of decades of conciliar reprogramming of Catholics could believe that, in this composite babel of heretics, protesters, and those given over to vice, there remains at least some space for those who are orthodox, devoted subjects of the Roman pontiff, and virtuous. End quote. Again, Francis' statement was made in light of being some se uh, there being some secular feast of fraternity and brotherhood, which Francis has been openly promoting, which makes this all the more rich. Now, there's another response, and it's not nor it's normally a one I don't make, not because I don't like the person who made it, and to be clear, I don't dislike Taylor Marshall, but because I usually refrain from referencing other Catholic commentators on our side of things at all. But Taylor Marshall pointed out something here. Francis rejected the hermeneutic of continuity. That's big because the hermeneutic of continuity had been John Paul II and Benedict XVI's official position, meaning they aren't Catholic by Francis' own standard. If you don't know what the hermeneutic of continuity is, according to one of the biggest champions of Vatican II, quote, the hermeneutic of continuity or renewal refers to those who would hold that very little actually changed at Vatican II, that it was a quote-unquote reaffirmation of all that went before, only cast in new language so as to be understandable to the modern era, end quote. That's the hermeneutic of continuity, that what came of Vatican II was just essentially a reframing of what came before, and that everything from the Council should be understood in that light. That comes from the National Catholic Reporter. Now, I'm not a hermeneutic of continuity person because of what actually happened at the Council, the rejection by an organized group of innovators of the prepared and very Catholic-sounding documents that had been presented at the start of the Second Vatican Council, and I have a few of those documents on my channel, actually, if you want to hear them, and they had rejected them in favor of new materials that we ended up getting, 
done by people who compared Vatican II to France in 1789 and Robespierre and the rest of them, men who praised the likes of Luther and Calvin and said they were continuing their work inside the church. I don't think Cardinal Swenens and Father Ratzinger at the time were big on that continuity either, though Ratzinger later as Pope Benedict XVI clearly had a change of heart to some degree. But the point Taylor Marshall makes is important, and literally no one else seems to have noticed, so a hat tip to Dr. Marshall. The hermeneutic of continuity had been the formal policy of the Vatican since the 1970s, under John Paul II until 2013. Does that mean that Benedict isn't Catholic by this definition? I'd like some clarifying statements from Rome, please, because it sounds like the hermeneutic of rupture has been endorsed instead. And for those who don't know what that means, a hermeneutic of rupture is the other position competing with that of the hermeneutic of continuity. That Vatican II represents a break from our Catholic past and is something different than what came before. To that end, I'll be providing in the near future a video on how the sacraments were changed after Vatican II as evidence of this claim. And no, I won't be saying that they're, you know, invalid sacraments, to be clear, but they were changed. And that video was requested by the audience, and I've promised to do so before, so it's time to deliver. Look for that on a weekend in the near future. In closing, at the core of this debate is ambiguity. Father Ripperger said this in a recent talk with Ryan Grant that you can hear on Census Fidelium. He says, quote, this lack of precision is causing a lot of problems. This has been the mindset of many in the magisterium. They don't want to be precise because they don't want to quote-unquote offend people. They should be worried about making sure they understand what the church teaches. End quote. And that sums up a lot of what is going on, at least for some of the prelates who don't have a mission of, you know, stirring up evil in the church. But the one thing is this. The teachings of the church have always been clear. Ambiguity is not a mark of Christ. It comes from somewhere else, but it isn't Catholic at all. And ambiguity has marked the period since the Council. And it's worth noting that the same men who had implemented Vatican II were the same men who wrote and approved those documents, and they admitted that they wrote the documents to be ambiguous, knowing full well how they planned to implement them. I've called Francis the living, breathing spirit of Vatican II before, and I stand by that statement now. But it is time for that ambiguity to come to an end. And in a weird way, we should be thankful for Francis because he is clearing up that ambiguity about everything, just not in the way that anyone who holds to the hermeneutic of continuity would want. Maybe that's an act of mercy from God. Now, what do you think of all this? I went a little longer today, but frankly, there will probably be more coming out on this, maybe even from a national bishops conference near you, so be watching for that. If you're in Ireland, the UK, Australia, the Philippines, or any place outside of America where I am, and your bishops make a statement about this, email it to me, please. But otherwise, let me know your thoughts on this in the comments, and always pray for the church. Thanks for listening and for your support of this channel. It is appreciated. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.